Stanford University. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some, you know, some interesting aspects of computing and probability theory and how they kind of come together. Um, I like to keep presentations interactive, so actually in the middle we'll do a little interactivity that might involve a little work on your part or at least one person in this room. Um, but if there's any questions or anything that you want to chat about along the way, just feel free to pipe in because I think it's just more worthwhile to kind of discuss things as we go along rather than just sort of having a formal presentation. Um, so first of all, I want to welcome you all back to the farm. Um, as was mentioned, I couldn't, I can't really, it's hard to reach escape velocity from Stanford. So um, I tried to leave for a little while and didn't get very far and then came back. Um, but it's just, it's been a fun place to be and I'm sure you know that having been here. Um, to really get into sort of the, the meat of the discussion, I brought along my trusty lightsaber. I figured that for this crowd, you would actually know what a lightsaber was and appreciate it. Most of my students today these days actually weren't born at the time they had to worry about one of these. Um, but it's more fun with a group of folks who actually remembers it. Um, so I wanted to start off by talking a little bit just about probability theory and kind of the way people think about probability traditionally and why they don't necessarily think of it as something that relates to computing. Um, but it, how in the last couple decades it's actually become very central to a lot of problems that happen in computing. And part of the reason is this. Usually when we think about probability theory, if we learned about it in some class at some point way in the past, someone had a bunch of urns. I colored them cardinal red here for obvious reasons. And there were balls. And basically when people thought about probability, they thought about balls going into urns. And you have some balls and they can go into different urns. And you have, what's the probability that a ball goes into a different urn? And you have three red balls and two white balls in an urn. You pull out a ball, what's the probability that it's a white ball? And one, that's not particularly compelling because most people don't sit around playing with balls and urns. But secondly, it doesn't show how the power of probability really relates to a bunch of problems that exist in the real world. And so one of the things I like to share with my students is say, well, Rather than thinking of urns, what's something you know about in computer science? How about computers? OK. Um, what's something you do with a computer? Well, I go online and I go to a website. Well, where does your web request go? It's a ball that goes into an urn. And it can go into different urns depending on how big the server farm is and how the server farm distributes your request and what kinds of things it does with it. And those are balls and urns. They're just not balls and urns in the traditional sense that we think of. And there's lots of things that turn out to be balls and urns or dice, like flipping coins or rolling dice, um, that map to problems in computing. And that's what I want to spend a little bit of time talking with you about today. So to think about probability in practice, um, that's a little graphic I like to show. How many people get spam in their email? I would imagine the vast majority of people. One of the places that probability theory is actually used uh, very effectively is filtering out spam from your email. So most people are actually shocked to find out. Anyone know what percentage of email is actually spam of all the email that gets sent? Anyone want to venture a guess? Yeah, it's, it's somewhere, depending on who you talk to, somewhere in the range between 85 and 95%. Um, and so if the messages you get in your inbox, if for every real message you get, the other 19 are not spam, that's because there's probably a spam filter in there somewhere that's getting them all out. You might say, well, I still get a lot of spam, Maron. Well, if you're getting 10 spam messages for one real message, that means half of your spam has actually been filtered out somewhere along the line. And hopefully, you don't get that much spam. Um, but to sort of bring this into you know, nuts and bolts, right? we could kind of talk about high level applications every day. I actually wanted to do a little math because I think it's fun to understand the math of probability and do some examples before we get into it. And so there's a couple concepts we need to know. One is a sample space, which I'm just going to refer to as S. And it's the set of all possible outcomes of an experiment. That's just a highfalutin way of saying if I take a die and I roll it, this is an experiment. And the possible values that can come out are the numbers 1 through 6. That's the sample space for a die is just the values 1 through 6. So we can think of a bunch of different things in formally defining their sample space. A coin flip has a sample space of heads or tails, assuming it doesn't land on its side like that Twilight Zone episode, and then you can read minds. That usually doesn't happen in the real world. Um, flipping two coins, you can think of the sample space being all the ways of getting heads or tails on two coins, and so the ordering of of the flips matter. So heads and tails is different than getting tails and heads, which I just abbreviated HT and TH. Um, the number of emails you get in a day could be something that is potentially unbounded, right? I mean, luckily for us, usually it tends to be finite. But you can think of a sample space that is unbounded, right? The number of emails you, couldn't, you could conceivably get in a day could be on the order of millions. Um, and the number of hours you spend on YouTube, if you're sort of the kind of person who watches video, we can also have real valued sample spaces. That's fine. It doesn't have to be discrete. 
And so when we think about sample spaces, when we want to define a probability, we think of an event. An event is just some subset of the sample space. So an event could be we flip a coin, and the event we care about is the coin coming up heads. So the sample space is heads or tails, but we care about the coin coming up heads. We can say, what's the, prob what's the event space of getting more than one head on two coin flips? And that's just all the cases where we get at least one head on the two flips of the coin. The number of emails in a day, this is what I like to refer to as a good day. This has not happened since about 1992. Um, getting less than 20 emails in a day, so it's just some subset of the integers, the positive integer or non-negative integers there. Or a wasted day, this is something I think more of for my children, um, where they spend more than five hours. They don't actually, I don't let them spend more than five hours a day watching YouTube, but you could kind of think of it that way. Okay? So that's, any questions about the notion of a sample space or an event? It's just we do something, and the sample space is all the ways that it can come out, and the event is the subset of things we care about. Okay? And probability now, once we have this notion of sample space, is just defined by three simple axioms. And so to think about how probability is defined, if we think about in the limit, if we think about doing an experiment, we just say, what's the fraction of times that the event we care about happens divided by the total number of times and we do the experiment? So if we flip a coin 100 times and 50 of those times the coin comes up heads, we'd say 50 over 100 is the probability, or 0.5% is the chance that the coin comes up heads. And Probability is defined in the limit, at least a particular notion of probability called frequentist probability is defined in the limit. If we were to do the experiment infinitely often, what would we expect that fraction to approach? And the three axioms that define probability, and after the axioms, then we'll start getting into applications very quickly, because we'll, you basically will have probability theory basically in two minutes. Probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. That's just how probabilities are defined. That's axiom 1. Axiom two is the probability of the entire sample space has to be one. So if I say I roll this die, what's the probability that it comes up a one through six? That has to be 100%, right? I can't roll the die and it comes up on its side and say, oh, guess what? Bad things happen. I'm guaranteed that my probability of my entire sample space is one, which means I'm guaranteed to get one of the events in my sample space. And the only thing that makes probability interesting from a mathematical perspective, because the first two axioms are actually pretty trivial, is the third one that really defines probability is that if E and F are mutually exclusive events, that means they don't have any, event, any uh, particular uh, events in common. What I mean by that is rolling this die, 1 through 3 is one event versus 4 through 6 is another event are mutually exclusive. They don't share any particular items in common. If they're mutually exclusive, namely their intersection is 0, then the probability of either one happening is the sum of the two probabilities. So the probability of rolling a 1 through 3 plus the probability of rolling a 4 through 6 is the probability of rolling a 1 through 6 because the events are mutually exclusive. And that defines probability. That's it. Now, there's a whole rich literature that comes out of that, right, and hundreds of years of work on probability theory, but comes out of these three axioms, which is pretty fun. Okay? So let's do a couple examples with equally likely outcomes. And what I mean by that is when I do some experiment, like flipping a coin or rolling two dice or rolling one die, each of the possible outcomes has the same probability. So when I roll this die, assuming it's fair and not loaded, um, each of the sides on the die can come up with the same, we have the same chance of coming up. And so the probability of each outcome is just one over the total number of outcomes, right? That's not particularly surprising. If I have more than one possible outcome I care about, like what's the probability of rolling a one or a two, I just count the number of outcomes I care about, one and two divided by six, which is my total number of outcomes, I get one third. And that, that simplistic fraction is going to give us a huge amount of power in being able to do data analysis. Okay? So now it's time to sort of think a little bit about independence. Independence or I do two things where the outcome of one does not necessarily impact the outcome of the other. If that's the case, then I call the two events independent. And the probability of, say, rolling a one here and rolling a one here is just the product of one-sixth times one-sixth. It's the probability of each one, and I multiply them together if they're independent. And if I have, otherwise they're called dependent. So if I said, you know, for example, if rolling a die here actually changed the probabilities of the different sides coming up on this die, then they would be dependent. For example, the kind of how successful you are in your career may be dependent on the place you went to college. So that would be a dependent event. Whether or not you believe that, but that may well be the case. Um, if three events, if we call them E, F, and G, if we, those are three events, if we want to consider those being independent, then we have to say that every pair of events is independent and all three are independent. That's kind of a big mouthful. Let me show you an example that brings this to having a little bit of intuition. Let's consider two dice. Okay? So we have our two dice, and what we're going to do is we're going to roll the two dice. Yellow is going to be the first die. Orange is going to be the second die. And so the first event, E, is defined as this die rolling a one. 
And the second event, f, is defined as this die rolling a 6. So first question I can ask, and this is the audience participation part, are, are the events e and f independent? Yes, right, because roll, whatever I roll on this doesn't impact what gets rolled on here. Okay, so there are now let's define a new event, which is the sum of the dice is 7. Okay, our E, which is rolling a 1 on this die, is this independent of the sum of the two dice being 7? Oh, we get a little bit of back and forth. It's interesting. Um, so to just say, reveal the answer, Here's how we think about the probability, right? It's if the probability of both things happening is the same as the product. So the probability of rolling the 1 is 1 6. The probability of rolling a 6, which would give me a sum of 7, is 1 6. And the probability of rolling a 1 on the first die and a 6 on the second die is 1 36. So in fact, the product of these two things, countering our intuition, because we think the sum is somewhat dependent, is the joint event getting E and G is in fact the product of the individual event, so it's independent. Mathematically it's independent. So then we can ask a question, are F and G dependent? Now that you have a little bit more information, is rolling a 6 on this die independent of getting a 7 on both dice? Yes. Okay, by the same reasoning. Now here's the interesting thing. Every pair of events is independent from every other pair. E and F are independent. F and E and G are independent. F and G, we just said, by symmetry or independence. What about all three events? Is rolling a 1 on the first die, rolling a 6 on the second die, and rolling a 7 as the total, are those three all independent? No. And in fact, the answer is no. Mathematically, because if we think about all three things happening, the probability of all three things happening is 1 36th, right? There's 36 possible combinations of rolling these two die, and there's exactly one, namely rolling a 1 on this one, rolling a 6 on that one. So one out of the 36 combinations that gives me rolling a 1, rolling a 6, and rolling a sum of 7. But if I take the product of probability of E, probability of F, probability of G, I get 1 over 2 16, and those are not the same. So one of the things about probability that sometimes defies intuition is subsets of events can be independent, but if I put more things into that pot, there can be dependency. Okay? So they're not independent. Those three are not independent. Let's now take this to the case of the internet and think about some things about how when someone sends an email or makes a web request for some website, how does their message from computer A get over to computer B? And so we can think about a bunch of computers that your message can potentially go through, different ways that it can be routed through the internet. And this is a very simplified example, because usually when you send a message from somewhere to somewhere else, it goes through multiple computers, but we're just going to make it one hop through a computer. And so we're going to say each one of these paths is independent. So each of the computers on the path is working with the same probability p. Some of the computers may fail, and so they fail with probability 1 minus p, because they either fail or are working, and the sum has to add up to 1. And so we want the event E to represent that there's a working path from A to B. That means if you send your email from A, there's some way you can get to B and ask what's the probability of there being a working path. Okay? So here's another thing that sometimes the thing that you would think is the simple intuitive answer is a little bit different than we think of. If the probability of each machine working is 20% and I have five different paths, am I guaranteed that there's a path from A to B? No. And it's because I'm not just multiplying 5 times 0.2. What I really want to think about is the probability of there being a path is 1 minus the probability that all the paths fail. Well, what's the probability that all the paths fail? It's the probability that a machine is working. 1 minus that probability is the machine has failed. And there's n machines that are all independent. So I just raise this to the nth power. This is the probability that all the machines have failed. And so 1 minus that probability is the probability that there is actually at least one machine working. And so if I consider n being 5, I have about a 2 thirds chance, or about 67% there's a working path. As I add more and more machines to the network, what I get is something that asymptotically approaches 1, but doesn't ever get to being exactly 1. But as I increase the number of paths, assuming the machines have the same failure probability, then my probability gets higher. 
And it's this kind of basic analysis sort of done on steroids where you think about the large interconnectivity of the internet which determines for us things like how many machines, how we want to route through different kinds of machines to have robustness in the network based on probabilities of failures along different paths. And that's something we can analyze based on data of how often things stay up and go down. And paths generally through networks are not independent. That creates additional complications for us. But it gives you a notion of kind of the basic workings of things. Okay? Now we can sort of think about raising it up a level and not thinking about just the basics of probability and independence, but also think about conditional probability. And the notion of conditional probability is the probability that E occurs given that something else, which we'll call F, has already happened. So what's the probability you will have a successful career conditioned on the fact that you got a bachelor's degree from Stanford? Right? So that can impact the probability of something later on. And so we write this as P with a little bar. That means conditioned on F, or what's the probability of E given that F was already observed? And there is a famous theorem due to Reverend Thomas Bayes, who I'll show you a picture of in just a second, that basically says we can compute this probability, the probability of E given some event F, as the probability of E and F happening divided by the probability of F. And we can actually rewrite that slightly differently mathematically, which says actually flip this around. What's the probability that F would have happened given that E happened times the probability of E? This portion up here is mathematically equivalent to E and F happening. It's sort of like E happens first and then F happens given that E happens. Happened. So that's Bayes' theorem. We'll actually come back to that in just a second. But to give you an example, if I think about the probability of rolling 10 on two dice, given that the first die was a 5. So I tell you the first die was a 5. What's the probability of rolling a 10 is 1 sixth, because I have to roll exactly a 5 on this die. Notice that the conditioning matters. What's the probability of rolling a 10 if I roll 1 on the first die? Zero. So it, in fact, makes a difference that we observed what we saw on the first die to help us with the probability for the second die. And you could think about computing that using this formula by saying the probability of rolling a 10 and the first die being a 5 is 1 in 36, because there's only one way to do that, rolling two fives. And you divide that 1 uh, over 36 by 1 6, then you get the same answer. So mathematically, it sort of comes out to the, the matches your tuition, the notion, intuition, the notion of conditioning. Now we can take this idea. Um, and interestingly enough, it's not like this is anything that is, uh, you know, rocket science in 2010. This is actually something that dates back to the 18th century with Thomas Bayes. But it's interesting to think about that, you know, back in 1996, Steve Ballmer was still a senior vice president of Microsoft and Bill Gates was still chairman. And Gates was already talking about the role of Bayesian systems and computer systems at the time. Actually, a lot of other people were as well. But these are you know, just some people who are well known, just to sort of show you that it's really in the last kind of two decades a lot of this stuff has taken, it has really come to the fore. Here's a picture of Thomas Bayes just for historical completeness, uh, 18th century British mathematician, pre Presbyterian minister. And just oddly enough, he looks remarkably similar to Charlie Sheen. Um, I just thought I would share. Totally irrelevant. Um, it applies, and it comes up in a bunch of places just to give you some applications before we delve into some, uh, some more uh, meat and potatoes of the mathematics underneath the hood. Um, you know, Harry Potter, a fair number of folks, or, you know, potentially your kids. My kids are just getting to the age where Harry Potter is coming into their consciousness. Um, when we think about hey, people who bought this book tended to buy these other books. Well, one way you could think about that is conditional probability. If you bought book X already, what's the probability you would buy book Y? And if you have a whole bunch of data about people's purchasing behavior, you can compute that probability. There's more sophisticated things you can do on top of that, but that's a very simple application of something that you can do um, in terms of trying to make what we refer to as an inference or, or determining some new information based on previous information that you have. Um, so I wanted to do a little example with you just to talk about the power of conditional probability, which is to play the game show Let's Make a Deal. Anyone ever remember the game show Let's Make a Deal with Monty Hall? How many people have seen this problem before? A couple folks. There are a few people who haven't. So what we're going to do is the game show, we don't actually have doors here. I'm going to do it with envelopes. What we have is we're going to have three envelopes or three doors in the game that I'll label A or I'll talk about as A, B, and C. Behind one of the doors is a prize, and the prize is equally likely to be behind any door, and behind the other two doors is nothing. Okay? So you get to choose a door. And so to make this worthwhile, I figured I sort of have to put my my money where my mouth is, although there isn't a lot of money involved because I'm teaching. Um, we have a $20 bill, and we'll put a little note on it, which help you remember where you got that $20 bill, which was at Stanford. 
okay? So we're gonna put the 20 inside, and part of the reason I have this green sheet is actually it makes it less likely someone will look through the envelope to actually determine if there is money in that envelope or not, okay? So I'm gonna put this into an envelope, and I have two other envelopes that I put green sheets into that are blank envelopes. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask someone now to come up here and pick one of the envelopes. So I need a volunteer. Come on down, first one to raise your hand. What's your name, by the way? Roger. Hi, Roger. Nice to meet you. Maron. So, Maron? Maron. Huh? Yes. Pick an, okay, there you go. Don't look in the envelope yet. So you get to, you've chosen your envelope now. Now what we're going to do in this game is I'm going to open one of the other two envelopes. So we're guaranteed that at least one of the other two envelopes has nothing in it, right? Because if he had the money, I would have two empty envelopes. If he didn't have the money, I would have one empty envelope. So I can sort of look in and see which envelope I need to open. Okay, so here's an envelope, one of the three that you didn't choose. And so I'll open it up, and there's the green paper in here, but there is no money and no Stanford, which is more important, inside that envelope. So now I've revealed to you that one of the envelopes doesn't contain the prize. And so now the question is, I'm going to give you the option to change for the other envelope. Wait, where is the other? That's, sorry. Here is the other envelope. I'm going to give you the option to change for the other envelope. And the question is, should you? Okay, now if you use probability theory, you can think about whether or not it makes any sense to change for the other envelope. Okay? If you don't switch, just to sort of give you the easy case, if you don't switch, your probability of winning is one third, right? Because it's, your selection was random. And if you don't switch, it doesn't make a difference that I showed you some information because the money was in one of the three envelopes and you picked one. Okay, so are we sort of all happy with that? probability is one-third. Now, here's the analysis, okay? Without loss of generality, say you picked A and the winning prize is actually in A, okay? So if A is the winner, the probability that A was the winner is one-third because it's just one of the three envelopes. So I opened either B or C, and if you switch, you're switching away from A. So you're switching to one of the other losing envelopes. So the probability that you win if A was the winner and you picked A but then you switched to zero. Right? Does that seem to make sense? Okay. What happens in the other cases? What if B is the winner? So if B was the winner and you picked A, my only choice to open an envelope was C. Because he has A, so I can't open A. The money's in B, so I can't open B. So the only thing I can open is C to show an empty envelope. So I have to open C. What happens if you switch now? Yeah, do you win? You win. Well, you do win, right? In this particular case where B is the winner, then, you're, then so your probability of winning, if B is the winner, you picked A and you switched is one because the only thing that you will get is B. And that, by symmetry, follows in the case where the winner is C, right? So in the case where it's C, I have to open B because he has A. C is the winner, so my only option to open is B. And so if C is the winner, you picked A and you switched, your probability of winning is one. So if I put these three things together, the probability that you win, given that you picked A and you switched, is a third times zero, a third times one, plus a third times one, so it's two thirds. So strangely enough, you've gotten information and you're better off switching. Now I can ask you, do you want to switch? Of course. All right. <laughs> it's often called the Monty Hall. It is, the, yes, exactly, the Monty Hall problem. And I really hope it works. <laughs> there it is. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, certainly. <laughs> Just don't forget Stanford when they come ask you for a donation. <laughs> um, so we can take the same idea and apply it. So this is the notion of why conditional probability is actually useful. Okay? We can take the same idea and apply it in a computer science sense to be able to filter, for example, unwanted email, like spam email. So how do we do this? And the way we do this is what we think about is what percentage of email sent is spam? Before I told you it's about 85 to 90 percent, 85 to 95 percent. Just to keep the numbers a little bit more reasonable, I'm just going to use 60 percent here. But you could actually redo the analysis with a different probability. 
When spam gets sent, there are certain things in the email that you can look at. And one of them is the header information. The header information says things like, who is this email being sent to? Uh, how is it? What server is it being sent out of? Things like that. And it turns out a lot of spam email that gets sent actually has what we refer to as forged headers, or headers where someone made them up. They're not actually coming from the place they say they're coming. And oftentimes, they actually get them wrong. So they don't match the standard for what should really be in a header. So 90% of email that's spam has an error in the header information. Now, if all legitimate email that was sent was, didn't have this error in the header information, we'd be happy. We'd just say if it's got an error in the header information, it's highly likely to be spam, so let's throw it out. The problem is computer programmers make mistakes. Right? And legitimate email programs that are sending out things that are non-spam email, like this email you spend, send, on occasion actually make errors in the header information they write. So let's say about 20% of the time. So there's errors on both sides. So the question that we want to ask is if E is a message that is actually spam, okay, that's the event that we care about. And F is the fact that the message contains an error in the header. So this is something when we receive that email, we can detect. We can see, does that email actually match the standard? And if it does, then we know that F is false. And if it doesn't match the standard, there's an error in the header, then we know F is true. What we're trying to determine in knowing F, so knowing conditioned on F, we're trying to determine the probability of E, that the message is actually spam. So it's what's the probability of E conditioned on F. And the way you can think about this is it's Bayes' theorem. Okay? So the probability of E conditioned on F is the probability of F conditioned on E times the probability of E over the probability of F. I can write this out in longhand. The probability of F is what's the probability that the message contains an error in the header. Well, I didn't give that to you directly, but you can actually compute this by saying, well, let me consider the two cases. I consider the case where it is spam multiplied by the probability of getting an error in the header in the case of it's being spam. And I can consider the case where it's not spam and consider the probability of an error in the header where it's not spam. So those probabilities I all have, and I can now stick them into Bayes' formula. So probability of there being an uh, error in the header given that the message is spam is 90%. The a priori probability that the message is spam is 60%. And that, these same two terms are the first two terms here, so they show up here. What's the probability a message is not spam? It's just 1 minus 60% or 40%. And what's the probability that the header will have an error if it's not spam? That's 20%. So I have all the numbers I need. And what I get out of this now is just by looking at the header information, I've increased my determination of if this message is a spam message from being 60% beforehand to now being almost 90%. So I'm still not ex entirely sure, right? And if I was only 90% sure, there could be like 10% or 13% of your real email messages that are getting thrown out. And we probably don't want to do that, so we need to do a little bit better. But it shows you how even one piece of information can drastically change your probabilities. And so the question that comes up is, well, how do we do better? Okay. So to go to a more historical example, we can actually analyze text that's in emails. But before we go back to the case of emails, I'll actually give you a famous historical analysis that was done. If you ignore the order of words, and you might say, but Maren, that's just such a brain damaged idea. If someone's writing English, why would you ignore the order of the words? That makes so much difference. Well, it turns out you can actually get a lot of information from someone's writing ignoring the order of the words. Okay? We can ask, what's the probability of any given word you write in English? So you've written a whole bunch of things, presumably over time. If we had some of your works available, say publicly available, if someone wrote a book, we could say, what is the probability of each word that they write? So I say, you're going to write a word, Avery. What's the probability that the word's going to be the? And we'd look back all your writings and say, oh, about 1% you know, of everything you've ever written is the word the. So it's 1%. And I say, well, what's the probability of the word transatlantic? And you say, oh, well, that's a, that probability of that's about you know, one in a million. Because out of a million words that I write, I might use transatlantic once. That's fine, but it's a small probability. We can still compute it. Okay? So probability of the word the is greater than the probability of the word transatlantic. I'd like to think for this group, the probability of Stanford is greater than the probability of the word Harvard. But if you went to grad school somewhere else, that's fine too. But the probability of each word can be measured just by looking at known writings. Okay? And the interesting thing is if we now look at the probabilities of different words, they are different for different writers. Right? That kind of makes sense. Not everyone writes the same way. The probability of someone writing the word sunny, given that they live in California, is probably higher than the probability of someone writing sunny if they live on the East Coast. Nothing against the East Coast, just pointing out a fact that might be you know, that's, that's kind of readily, more readily apparent. Okay? 
So if we were to actually estimate the probability of each word given the writer from someone's known writings, then using our friend Bayes' theorem, we can flip that probability around and determine the probability of the writer given the words that we see in their writing, okay? even when we don't know who the writer is. So I'll show you a historical example of this. Have you ever heard of the Federalist Papers? Right? Federalist Papers were actually written around the time of the ratification of the Constitution. It's a collection of 85 essays that were written in favor of ratification of the Constitution by the colonies. They were all written under the pseudonym Publius. Okay, so the author was not attached to the writers. But it became well known that the authors, the people who comprised Publius, were really Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, shown in profile over there just for completeness. Okay? And so the question that comes up is, each of the essays was written by a different person. It was one of three people, but we don't know who. Luckily for us, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay happen to write a lot of other stuff that they actually put their name on. So if we want to answer the question, who wrote which essay, what we do is we go and look at the writings that we know that they wrote. We look at the probabilities of the different words that they used, and then we use Bayes' theorem using the words in the Federalist Papers to be able to predict who wrote each one. And in fact, people have done this analysis, right? We do, still don't know the true answer, right? There's a lot of speculation about what the true answer actually is, and people have looked at it from a lot of different perspectives. But it's sort of believed that the computer program is somewhere around like 85 to 90% accurate in its prediction, okay? We can take that same idea, so that kind of gives you it in historical context, and apply it to something that shows up in your mail server. Okay, so here's a little spam email I got a while back, and luckily um, the email servers at Stanford, if you sort of open them up a little bit, actually give you a bunch of information about what, how they try to determine if something is spam or not. And one of the things that shows up here is the Bayesian spam probability. So in fact, it is using Bayes' theorem to determine how spammy this message is. And this one was marketed be, as being, you know, score of 1.0, probabilities of 1 never happen. So it's just how rounded it close to 1. Um, but the idea here is from a set of known legitimate and spam emails. If you ever have an email system you're working with and it has a spam folder and it says, hey, you can mark some of your email as spam or you can go through your spam folder and pull out some of the emails as spam, guess what you're doing? You're marking emails as being spam or not and so the system can analyze the word frequencies in the emails that are spam versus the emails that you say are non-spam that are your emails and determine what the probability of word usage is in the spam emails versus the non-spam emails. Okay? So now a new email comes along. So someone sends you a new email. For the new email we want to determine whether the words present are more likely if we condition on spam or non-spam. What I mean by that is if we were to say the writer of that email was a spammer, that gives us a particular probability of each word appearing. And if we say that the writer of the email was a non-spammer, that gives us a particular probability of the word appearing. For the words we saw, which case is more likely? Which case has higher probability? Okay? So going from the Federalist Papers to spam, if you think about it this way, I would hope, for the vast majority of everyone in here, the probability of seeing the word Viagra in your email, given that it's a legitimate email, is much lower than the probability of seeing that same word given spam. Okay? Um, perfectly fine if someone takes it, not so great if someone's selling it online. Okay? So how do we do this? Because we have a large number of words in English, right? The number of variables we have is potentially huge because we're not just looking at one word anymore. We're looking at the occurrence of all possible words in English. As a matter of fact, even more than that because you could consider spelling mistakes and punctuation, all kinds of things. So what we have is a uh, vector of variables, which I just call x1 through xm. m is huge. m is the number of words in English. It's on the order of about 120,000, OK? But what that says is that x1 is, did the word dog appear in the email? x2 is, did the word cat appear in the email? x3 is, did the word Viagra appear in the email? I can ask that question for every word in English. Okay? And I can determine a probability of that for every word in English. And so, given that I have all these variables, I can determine, did that word appear or not in this new email that I got? And the probability that that email was sent by a spammer, given this vector of all the possible words I can see is given to the pro the, by the probability, it's proportional to, by Bayes' theorem, the probability of seeing all those words given that it was a spammer times the a priori probability that it was a spammer. Now, mathematically, that's all good and well. You see that equation, you're like, oh, done. We can filter spam. It's a good time. There's just one problem with that. Any probabilist type in here see a problem with that, potentially? 
the size of this probability table. Right? What we need to say is what's the probability of seeing every single combination of words over 100,000 combinations? That's intractable. We just can't compute it for large n. The size of that probability table is exponential. It's 2 to the m, where m is 100,000. That's more than the number of particles in the universe. We're just done. You know, we see that, and we're like, oh, mathematically, we're done. Computationally, we're also done, but in a different way, and we can't solve it. So the way we actually solve this is we make a simplifying assumption. And the simplifying assumption says, if I were to know you're a spammer, I'm going to treat the probability of each word you write as being independent of every other word you write. Now you might say, but that's crazy, Maron. Like the probability of them writing, you know, capsule is dependent on the probability of them writing Viagra. It may be, but this simplifying assumption that takes this problem that's inherently exponential and turns it into a problem that's linear. All I need to know now is for every word individually, what's the probability that a spammer wrote that word? And I just multiply them all together. It's a simplification. It's a gross simplification. We call it the naive Bayes assumption because it's kind of taking this very nice idea of Bayes had and creating a very naive version of it. Some statisticians would refer to this as idiot Bayes if you don't want to be charitable. But I like naive Bayes. It's a little kinder. Um, but it works. It turns out ignoring the order of words in language and even ignoring the co-occurrence of words actually makes for an extremely effective spam filter. So we've run some experiments with things like this. This actually gets used in a lot of commercial systems. Um, you can get 99% um, of spam with something that's this simple. Um, here's a little chart that I borrowed from Google. Um, what this chart shows is over time, the percentage of all incoming Gmail traffic that is actually spam, the percentage of spam that is delivered to your inbox over time. And so you can see, you know, yeah, it was a little bit higher, but as you get more data, your probabilities get more accurate because you're estimating all your probabilities from data. So the amount of spam keeps going up, the amount that gets sent to the inbox doesn't. And that's part of the power of just harnessing lots of data in a probabilistic framework to actually be able to solve a problem like this. Um, and so they, one of the meth things they mention on their site is they combine hundreds of factors to classify spam. Um, so there's, there's actually more than hundreds of factors, but you get the sense for why the problem's intractable. Um, so I thought I would stop there for uh, a moment. There is some stuff related to web search that I could talk about. But rather than talking about web search, in the interest of time, I thought I'd leave you with one last problem, which is kind of something I'd like to think about Mark Twain saying. There's three kinds of lies. There's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics. And so I want to leave you with one parting idea around lying with statistics that has, you know, this kind of close to home, that has a little bit to do with statistics that universities report. Okay? Let's say we had a school with three classes. And the classes have 5, 10, and 150 students in them. Okay, So those are the three classes. We could ask the question, what's the average class size at the university? Right, Fairly straightforward question to ask. If we were to randomly choose, if we say all classes are equally probable to choose those classes, and x is the size of the chosen class, what we want is the expected value of x. That's basically the average value of the class size if we treat all the classes equally likely, which is what we do when we compute a straight average. Okay? So what is that? It's a third the, the chance that you're going to pick a five-person class, a third the chance you're going to pick the 10-person class, a third the chance you're going to pick the 150-person class. That's an average of 55 people. And if you ask most people this question, what's the average size of the class at the school, you would get 55. People would add the three things together, divide by three. That's the average class size, right? Well, what really matters at a school, right? It's not the fact that we randomly choose a class. Someone's a student at the school. And if you go and ask a student, how big is your class? What is the average class size that is perceived by students, which you're now randomly choosing as a student, not a class? So why is the size of the class that the student is in? And what we're asking is, what's the average value of the size of a class that student's in? This is what students actually are confronted with when they get somewhere, right? Well, what's the chance that you pick the class with five students? It's 5 out of 165, because there's 165 students total. The chance that you pick the class with 5 students is 5, and so you multiply that by 5. That's the chance you pick that class with a value of 5 students. What's the chance you pick the class with 10 students? 10 out of 165 multiplied by 10. What's the chance you pick the class with 150 students? It's a lot larger, because there's a lot more students in that class. So you have 150 there, and when you multiply it all together, the average class size is now 137. Okay? The interesting thing is, 
expectation of why the 137 is what students actually experience when they go to a school. Because when you ask them what's your average class size, their average class size, there are more students that are in large classes. So it's more likely that when you ask a student, they're in a larger class and so class sizes are larger. But when you report it, straight average seems to be a fairly reasonable thing. So just wanted to leave you with that as kind of a little uh, grain of salt that when you see statistics reported places, pay very careful attention to what they're actually computing because as I said, or as Mark Twain said, it's attributed to Mark Twain. People actually sometimes attribute it to other folks as well. Um, there are ways you can lie with statistics. And so after showing you all that other stuff you can do with statistics, just wanted to make sure everyone kept a critical eye about them. Well, thanks very much for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.